Okay, so today we'll um, we'll cover logistic regression and uh, classifiers in general. Okay, and we'll see um, we'll see how much we can do in, in terms of other other classifiers. Okay, so we've already talked briefly about uh, classification when we did our uh, trees, our recursive partitioning. So with decision trees, you can have a classification tree or you can have a regression tree, okay? Pretty much there's, in statistics, almost all things either fall under um, regression models, basically are you know, you take your inputs, to predict a numeric y, and with classification models, you take your inputs, to predict a categorical y. Okay? And so with linear regression, you take in your x and you do something to them and you get a predicted y, okay? And and a lot of times, you know, you optimize your regression model by trying to minimize your uh, residuals. Your sum of squared residuals is often the uh, what we're looking at, okay? And, uh, and then with classification models, generally we, we often try to minimize our error rates or our, you know, Gini index or, you know, some kind of purity, um, some entropy value, okay? And so um, there's lots of classifiers, okay? All right. So one we've pre, uh, we've looked at is we've already covered kind of our decision tree, and in your examples you did decision trees with regression models, but we could just as well do decision trees for categorical variables as well. Okay. For a categorical. Response variable. Okay, um, well, we can look at some probabilistic classifiers. Of which we have the of which we have logistic regression, as well as the Bayes classifier, Bayes classifier, and the naive Bayes classifier. Okay. And then we have kind of non probabilistic classifiers such as K nearest neighbors. Okay. Well, uh, let's start with logistic regression. Okay. Um, the example that will follow comes from this textbook, Applied Logistic Regression, and that is, uh, it's available to you for free while you're connected to the uh, UCLA network. So 
So you can uh, follow this link. And you can download, you know, you can download the whole book. I would say probably, well, chapters one through five, that's a, that's a lot. Um, at least start off with uh, chapter one, and then you can kind of look at um, chapters two through five if this is, uh, if you're interested in um, logistic, it's it's very practical uh, and uh, and applied, so uh, you don't have to worry too much about tons of math and theory going on there. Okay. Uh, the only drawback of this is that it doesn't use R in the uh, textbook, but uh, but I've given you some uh, example here. Okay. And then um, the. IDRA, uh, Institute for Digital Research and Education at UCLA, has some tutorials uh, for doing some uh, logistic regression. Okay, this is kind of a, an example. And I think these are, these are both very good uh, examples of what is going on in, uh, in logistic regression. Okay, so in, um, in the textbook, we're going to be looking at a data set that looks at uh, coronary heart disease, okay? And there's, uh, there's lots of, uh, as far as uh, coronary heart disease goes, there's lots of um, uh, variables that could, that could affect um, heart disease. But what we'll look at, we're going to just look at um, the relationship between age and heart disease, okay? So if we just look at the, uh, the head of this, this is what we have. So this is kind of our this is what, what we have. So we got person, we got a bunch of different people and they have different ages and Coronary heart disease is going to be a categorical variable. Either they have it or they don't, okay? Uh, we indicate that with either a 0 or a 1. And so, um, so we can create a scatter plot. Now, if I just do plot uh, age versus uh, CHD, uh, let's do CHD dollar sign age, CHD dollar sign age, and we create this plot, this is what it's going to look like, okay? And because age is a whole number in this data set, we can't even tell how many, um, like, if there's a great density or lower density here, right? If there's like 50 data points stacked here or not, uh, we can't really tell uh, with just the base graphics here, okay? So I've created a graph using uh, ggplot. And uh, are you guys? Are you guys familiar with ggplot, kind of, sort of, not really? OK, so, um, so with ggplot, we're going to map the age variable, the age column, to the x, x axis and the uh, coronary heart disease variable to the y axis. Okay, And, uh, and this, if I just plotted this along with uh, geome point, it, the plot, resulting plot would look exactly the same as what we have here, except it would just maybe uh, maybe just be a, a little bit more aesthetically pleasing, but it's pretty much exactly the same. So what we can do is uh, is we can jitter the points. Okay, jitter just means it's going to add or subtract a small value to um, kind of the uh, the uh, numbers and and what this uh, allows it to do is uh, allows us to kind of see a little bit of spread here, okay? And so I'll do um, geom jitter, and this means um, alter the height values up to 0.05, and geom in terms of the width up alter the uh, values up to 0.5, and then um, we're going to uh, do theme black and white just because it looks better for printing. And, uh, and add some labels here, which is, in this case, just a title. So if I run that,
Okay, so here is our resulting plot, okay? And, uh, and here now we can see definitely there's more points, uh, you know, kind of in this concentrated region and over here. So we can kind of get an idea of the concentration of our data points here. Okay, so that's what we have for uh, ggplot, okay? And so, um, so now we can see as age increases, it seems like it's, you're more likely to experience uh, coronary heart disease, right? So as that seems like, uh, and if we were to do just linear regression, we would get a line that probably goes from here to here or something like that, okay? But that's not really the relationship between age and coronary heart disease because with linear regression, that would also mean that at a certain po point, CHD would go over one in, uh, or below zero, which is, which is not the case. So what we want to do is we want to kind of create a relationship between age and maybe the mean value of CHD, okay? So what we can do is we can create a table that groups together the observations, okay? So we can create, um, you know, a bin from age 20 to 30, okay? Which will be, uh, you know, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, it looks like 14 or 15 people between the ages of 20 and 30, and of those, only two seem to have experienced coronary heart disease, so our average there would be kind of two out of 30, and you know we would get a small percentage. And so um, to do this, I'm using dplyr to create, um, to create a table, okay? And so this is done taking our table CHD, and then I'm going to create uh, a variable called age group, which I've, I'm using the cut variable. Okay, so when I do this, um, so I'm going to take CHD and then I create a new variable using uh, using mutate. Okay, and so this creates this puts each of these people into uh, age group you know, from 20 to 30, so on and so forth, from 30 to 35, and 35 to 40, so on, like this, up through uh, the bracket 16, 7. So with cut, I've created the breaks myself, going 20, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, up to, until I get to 60, and then I go, I skip 65 and I go to 70, okay? So that's going to be that. And then uh, we're going to create, using the age groups to create our groups, we'll do group by age group. And then we will summarize this by counting um, how many have coronary heart disease, how many, uh, how many do not have it, how many have it, and creating uh, a mean of that. So we'll take this and we will summarize this thing. Okay, and so now, so between 20 and 30, I guess there were uh, just a total of 10 people Nine people had it, so this would be 20 to 29. Out of those 10, nine did not have it and one did, so our mean is 0.1. Between the ages of 30 and 35, there were a total of 15, and of those, only two had it. Okay, so I guess between yeah, 30 and 35, we count these are the two that have it. And then over here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, up through 29, there's only one. Okay. Okay, so this is what we have. And then uh, to graph this, I'm going to create another column called midpoints, which is going to be the midpoints of these breaks. So this will be at 25, 32 and a half, 37 and a half, until uh, we get to 57 and a half, and then at 65. So I'm going to just create another column. To do this, okay. And so the resulting table that I produce as these means and these midpoints to plot. And then we can plot this, plot those mean values of 0.1 against 25, and we can see kind of a relationship between uh, the age and coronary heart disease. And we definitely see 
an increasing trend. Okay, and so this this line represents the mean uh, for this age group. You know, kind of the proportion that developed coronary heart disease. Okay, so at a certain point between uh, around 45 and 50, the uh, probability of coronary heart disease climbs over 0.5. Okay, and so basically we want to be able to fit a nice smooth curve to effectively this line, or truly it's it's the data that underlies here. And so in order to do that, we can use the logistic regression model, which you can see at the, uh, the bottom of the second page and, um, and how the, uh, the logit function works there. Okay? And so with the logistic regression model, basically we just have a linear regression model, beta 0 plus beta 1x uh, inside and whereas beta 0 plus beta 1x can go anywhere from negative infinity to positive infinity, depending on um, you know, the, the range of x, um, the resulting logistic regression will have a range of 0 to 1. Okay? So when x is really negative, you know, you'll have basically e to the negative infinity divided by 1 plus e to the negative infinity. And so e to the negative infinity would be 0, so we would have 0 divided by 1 plus 0, so 0 over 1, and we would have this equals 1. And on the other hand, if e goes to infinity, then we would have infinity divided by 1 plus infinity, okay? Or basically just a really large value divided by 1 more than that really large value, okay? So that's going to, as x approaches infinity, this value will approach 1, okay? And that's how we get a, a nice curve that is bounded in terms of its range from 0 to 1, okay? Over the domain from negative infinity to infinity, the range of this resulting function will be bounded um, from 0 to 1, okay? And then we can, you know, go back if we wanted to kind of undo the, uh, this, this is called the logit transformation. Okay, and this is, uh, you know, the function pi x divided by 1 minus pi x. This will become, and we take the log of that, that becomes uh, the linear relationship b0 plus b1x. Okay, so fitting such a, a model by hand is, um, is not something we do. <laughs> so uh, we would use the built-in general linear model in R to, to do this, okay? So we would call GLM, and we want to predict CHD coronary heart disease as a function of age, okay? And so the important thing is that CHD needs to be just uh, 0 and 1 values in order for this to work, okay? Which, which it already is in our data set, but, uh, you know, if you, if you want to do this, you have to basically... Um, if you've got a categorical variable, you've got to turn it into zeros and ones, okay? And logistic regression only works for a dichotomous situation where it is or it isn't. So you can't, if you've got categorical variable where it's like red, yellow, or blue, uh, this is not going to work. You either have to say red or not yet red, yellow or not yellow, or blue or not blue. And so anyway, we have a, you know, we're predicting our zero, one variable uh, based on age. We use this argument family equals binomial, okay? Family equals binomial is what we use for uh, logistic regression because our link function, the link function between kind of our linear regression model to our generalized linear regression model is the logit function, okay? And if you look up, is it question mark family? Family objects we have, they, they, uh, this will list off the different types of um, families that, that are allowed, okay? So binomial, uh, this is kind of like the, uh, the family of how our error terms are realized. So this would be a binomial, whereas the link being the identity, meaning if you are using beta 0 plus beta 1x, um, 
you know, kind of your error terms are modeled as a Gaussian, right? So that would be, um, and so anyway, you have, you have these things. The important thing is for logistic regression, we use a family binomial, okay? The data comes from here, and so this is all we have to do to fit our logistic regression model. Then we, uh, we call our summary on the resulting fit, and this is what we have, okay? We end up getting, um, you know, kind of coefficients and all of this. This tells us that, uh, you know, when we look at the estimate for the term coefficient for age, we get 0 0.11092. This doesn't have a very strong practical meaning at, our, at this juncture, but uh, what we can see is the resulting kind of p-value associated with this estimate is uh, you know, extremely small, meaning that we do have evidence that age is a factor in determining our uh, logistic regression model. And so, um, you know, if we wanted to create confidence intervals for our coefficients, you know, we, it's, it's definitely possible, okay? So we can just take a look at what that estimate of the coefficient is, okay? And that estimate, as we saw earlier, is 0 0.1109. And then you can call, um, create a, have our create a confidence interval for you just by calling the function con confident, okay? And it, it goes from 0 0.0669 to, you know, 0 0.16, right? So effectively, our confidence interval terms go from 0 0.067 to 0.162. And the, uh, the direct interpretation of this value of 0 0.11 is that if uh, age increases by 1, the estimated log odds increase by 0 0.111. This is what we are looking at. We are looking at the uh, log odds of, of the thing, which is, which is a very strange thing, okay? And, um, <laughs> and I, I wrote here, this is very hard to interpret because, first of all, talking about changes in odds, odds being kind of the... Um, it's not, it's not even a probability. Probability would be, uh, is easy to understand. That goes from zero to one as the probability that something will happen. Whereas the odds are basically the probability that it will happen divided by the probability that it won't happen, okay? So, uh, you know, in sports we'll say you got five to one odds, meaning, um, it's really five out of six, right? The probability is five six, meaning that the probability that it will happen is five six. The probability that it won't happen is one six. Then you do five six divided by one six, then you get odds of five. Whereas the uh, if you were at the disadvantage and the odds were one to five, the probability that happens is one six divided by the probability it won't happen of five six, and you have odds of basically point two. Okay. And so the odds go from anywhere from zero to infinity, and um, and then we're talking about l taking the log of that, which is which is even weirder, right? So um, this is the direct interpretation is the change in log odds, but it in terms of a practical thing, it doesn't it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because a change in log odds when the um, probability is high is going to be much smaller than a change in the log odds uh, kind of near our midpoints, okay? On the other hand, we could exponentiate the coefficients themselves to give us a change in the odds, okay? So now we have, uh, you know, 1.117, and then if we exponentiate uh, the results of the confidence interval, it goes from 1.07 to one point. 175, okay? So this is a tiny bit easier to understand. It says that um, our estimates, if uh, age increases by one, then the estimated odds ratio 
will change by 1.17, okay? Um, changing, uh, maybe changing age by one doesn't quite make sense, but uh, if we talk about changes when, uh, when we're going by a, a change of a factor of 10, we can talk about the, you know, the change in the odds ratio at uh, going from you know 20 to 30 or 50 to 60, we have a change in the odds ratio of about three. Okay, so these, again, this is a change in the odds ratio or the odds themselves, um, and not the not the relative risk. So not um, uh, not the not the probability there. Okay, so this would be something like uh, going from 5 to 1 odds to kind of 15 to 1 odds or something if, if we were already there or uh, if we were at even odds we would 50% uh, probability is 1 to 1 odds and then if we go up by 10 then our thing would change to 3 to 1 and so basically a 75% probability change increasing by 10 Okay, which let's uh, let's see if that matches kind of what we have. So if we we're at um, right here, so around 47, we are at 50 percent, and then if we go up 10 to 57, we do see the change goes from about 0.5 to 0.75. Okay, so going from even odds one to one corresponds to a probability of 50 percent. And if we increased our odds ratio by three, we would go to three to one odds, which would be 75% uh, uh, probability. Okay. So and that and that is kind of what we see here, going from 0.5 to 0.75 if we go up 10 points. Okay. Or uh, something like this. So going from 0.25 would be uh, one to three odds ratio, okay? So at age 37 and a half, we're at 0.25, increasing it, going up a factor of, ten, uh, going up 10 years uh, would increase our odds ratio by about three. And so one to three doesn't become uh, basically three to three or one to one, and that's kind of what we see here. So we do see our estimate of the odds ratio does make sense, okay? So to get that, we had to co uh, exponentiate our coefficient, right? So here, we we just take our our estimated coefficient was this zero point one one, and if we exponentiated that, it corresponded to an odds change or uh, of one point one one seven. But again, that's a little bit harder to see on the graph, so. We magnify that by saying, let's talk about a 10-year age change, and let's exponentiate that. And when we do that, we get an odds ratio change of about 3. Does, does that make sense, the change in odds, uh, what, what we're talking about? So we don't normally think of, uh, of probabilities in terms of odds, but it is, it is possible, and, um, and we uh, it, and it becomes necessary when dealing with these uh, dichotomous cases of, of either it is or it isn't because the, the change in probabilities are, are not linear. It doesn't, adding 10 years going from age 20 to 30 has a different effect than adding 10 years when you're going from age 40 to 50 or something like that. Okay, the, uh, the intercept is our estimate of the odd log odds ratio <laughs> or the odds ratio when we exponentiate when x is equal to zero. Okay, so in this case it would be cor equivalent to calculating the odds ratio or the log odds ratio for a, a newborn baby and you know that doesn't have a whole lot of meaningful interpretation but um, but in other cases, it might make sense to calculate something for um, 
for x equal to 0. All right, if we wanted to put the, um, the plots all together, we can create our, um, a, uh, a prediction based on our fit using our um, kind of our midpoints here and then um, finding the probabilities and then we would create a graph this way, okay? So, so if I ask for the predictions, this is, these are our predictions um, based on the uh, midpoints that we've created and then um, our predicted probabilities here and, uh, and if we create this, okay, so we observed a mean of, for the 10 observations in our age group, I don't know if I can get anything to fit here. So for the 10 observations in the 20 to 30 group, we observed one out of 10 for a mean of 0.1. And according to our model, we would predict uh, 0.07 as the probability. And uh, as, as it increases, so for uh, we observed 15 people in the 40 to 45 group of those 33% had coronary heart disease. And according to our model, we would predict around 35%. Okay, so this is just based on the estimates of all of this. To create a plot of this, we are going to plot these points, the plotting uh, midpoints, 25 and mean. So these are the actual kind of our summary data points that we have. So these are the points that will be plotted. We want to plot a smooth, smooth curve, okay? And this is done using stat smooth, okay? So ggplot will fit its own GLM method here. So we say method is GLM and we give it the arguments that the family is binomial. Okay, this I'm not expecting you to have this memorized but I think this is a good reference point if you wanted to create uh, a pretty graph mm -hmm. like this for yourself. So we would say you know create a, a fitted smooth curve using um, a generalized linear model with family equal to binomial and then SE equals true will put um, confidence interval bands around the resulting curve. Okay, and so when I create this plot, we get the kind of this nice looking plot that is on page five of your handout. Okay, and so we can see these dots are not the individual data points, but these are kind of the means of the data points that we've grouped together. And we can see how the resulting curve fits um, the uh, the data that we have, okay, and and it also puts the standard error bars around it to kind of show um, that the true curve could be really anywhere in between here, and you'll notice that um, because it's a logistic model going from zero to one, the standard error bar is not even everywhere it goes. So when uh, the predicted model, when the predictions are closer to zero. The standard error on one side is a lot smaller than the other side because uh, the changes, you know, here we're predicting something like, I don't know, 5% or something. So the changes from, you know, 1% to 5% is pretty significant, whereas going from 5 to around 12% is a little bit, um, is, is equal in terms of the, uh, the, the deviance in the standard error. Yes? Is this just no, these these none of these are outliers. These are these are data points that we uh, that they are. I think mine is good for the data. Yeah, right before that. Yeah. We're So yeah, these are from our summary table that we kind of used to create, if we had to just create a curve based on the data itself, we created, uh, you know, kind of this series of, of dots here. And we, we use that just kind of to see how our uh, logistic model
kind of fits the summarized data that we have. Okay, and then if you wanted to plot the actual data points onto it, um, these are all individual observations. Okay, of course the individual observations themselves are either the person has coronary heart disease or it doesn't, uh, or, or the person does not. So you're either only going to have zeros or ones, and so what we have here is that, uh, you know, around age 60, you know, you have more people that experience coronary heart disease than people who did not, and therefore, um, you know, the curve, the fitted line, uh, runs closer to, to one. Uh, however, the individual data points, either they did or they didn't. Okay, and again, there's some jitter here so, uh, to, for you to be able to distinguish data points from each other, so they're not all just stacked directly on top of each other, which would um, you know, make it a lot harder to, uh, to see the, uh, the data points here. Okay. If we had to use logistic regression as a classifier, and I don't, logistic regression never really was intended to be a classifier, okay? It, it was more so to just kind of give you a predicted probability of some event or allow you to understand, you know, how the changes in the, uh, the odds. But if you had to use it as a classifier, you can say, you can give it a rule such as if, um, when the prediction for probability climbs over 50%, then we would classify it as a yes, and if it's below 50%, we would classify it as a no. Now that's, I, you know, I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, it, it doesn't feel very good, but a lot of times people like to have nice and neat decisions and say, you know, we're going to predict that it is a yes or predict that it's a it's a no, right? It's kind of like, you know, on the weather forecast, they say a 52% chance of rain, um, then that, you know, that does that mean you pack your umbrella versus, you know, you have to make a choice. Do I pack the umbrella or do I not? And if it says 52% chance of rain, you would, and 48% chance of rain, you would not, or something like that. And, and probably your decisions should be a little bit more nuanced than some arbitrary line. Um, but, but that's what we have here, okay? And in this case, uh, if we are trying to predict whether someone has coronary heart disease or not, looking only at age, we would look at where this curve crosses 0.5, and that looks to be right around 47, okay? Or 48 or something, and we would say, okay, if age is over 48, we classify them as a yes, and if age is under 48, we classify them as a no, okay? And again, that would, um, you know, classifiers are always hard because the world is a little bit more nuanced, but in terms of um, if you just had a whole bunch of things to process through, you would you'd do something like this, okay? Um, so for example, when you apply for a credit card, right? They have to make a decision, approve or not approve, right? And basically, somewhere in there, there's, there's some, most likely, I don't know exactly what the credit card companies do, but I'm, I'm assuming if I, if I had to work for one and I would do something, um, I would create a logistic regression model that says, will this, what's the probability that a person will uh, default on a payment, okay? May, may, you know, miss a payment and we would lose money or something. And we would, uh, and I would rate that going from zero to one, and there would be different things that factor in, right? Their credit score could just be a single number uh, going from, what is it? I don't know, the low end, up to 850 or something. 300 to 850, and that would go on something, and we would get, uh, in that case, if it's probability of default, then it would start off high and then go down, okay? And then we might have just some arbitrary cutoff and say if somebody has over a 10% probability of default, we're not going to approve them of the credit card or over a 30%, you know, some arbitrary cutoff and using the logistic regression. We might factor in um, additional variables, okay? So in, in this case, 
uh, we only created, you know, we're predicting based on age only. But just like in multiple linear regression, you can have multiple predictors. You can have multiple predictors for logistic regression. They, you just have, uh, you know, an x1 and an x2. And those things get turned into a logistic regression model by uh, being converted through this um, kind of the logit transformation in terms of you just take your multiple regression, which goes anywhere from negative infinity to infinity, and you throw it into kind of the logit transformation, and it now goes from 0 to 1. So you want to take in things like income level and credit score. And that's probably all they really need uh, to get an estimate. And based on that estimate, um, they make a decision, uh, approve or deny. Okay, And it's, it's very, uh, um, you know, these rules are very strict. And, you know, if, if one of those things um, is not an accurate reflection of where you are today, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a lot harder to, uh, to kind of explain that and, and justify that. But, um, you know, for, for large kind of these faceless organizations that uh, make, make decisions, you know, they might have something like that for, uh, they might have a logistic regression model underneath, okay? Um, other things, um, so that's probably a very, uh, uh, strong use of logistic regression in terms of classifiers. Um, you know, other ones are, yeah, anytime they're trying to model some kind of uh, probability, a risk of some sort, and whether or not they should uh, take on a certain risk. They, they might model it using logistic regression. Okay. Is that, uh, are there any questions on this so far re regarding uh, logistic regression? Um, the, this website here, oh, not this one, this is the textbook. So definitely check out uh, chapter one of the textbook. I'm actually, I was going to make copies of chapter one and uh, pass that out, but I have to wait for the copy machine to finish properly. Um, here's some more, um, just uh, a, an example analysis here on uh, logistic regression. Okay. Um, okay. Are there questions on this? No. We're good? Okay. Why don't we um, take a short break here? And then we'll come back and then we'll take a look at the, uh, some of the other classifying models that, uh, that we can talk about.